Hello and welcome to our time together this morning. We hope that everybody is ready to study the Bible in this sermon, and we hope everybody's doing well as far as their physical health is concerned. We certainly want to keep each other before the throne of God's mercy in prayer, and we want to strive to do what we can in this emergency time to be, as the Bible says, Christians ought to be ready unto every good work as that work avails itself and is taught in the scriptures. We hope that this message today will be one that will strengthen everybody as we do all our Bible teaching and sermons that we bring. Today, we're going to be studying from Joshua chapter 22 in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 22. And we will be looking at what I have called Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar. Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar. And you will see how that comes together as we go through the study this morning and see the principles of truth that apply to us today as we serve God under the authority of Christ in the New Testament, Colossians 3, verse 17. We want to emphasize from this passage of Scripture fellowship, division, fact-finding, and fairness. I'll mention those again. Fellowship, division, fact-finding, and then fairness. So the aim of this sermon is that in spiritual Israel, the church, we will follow the example of fleshly Israel when resolving problems that arise in the church. And of course, I'm referring to the example found in Joshua 22, 1 through 6. Now, let me read from that passage. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said unto them, Ye have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. Ye have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge on the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren, as he promised them. Therefore now return ye, and get, a, get you into your tents, and unto the land of your possession, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side of Jordan. Then he goes ahead to emphasize, But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and serve him all your, with all your heart and with all your soul. And then the last verse, verse 6. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went into their tents. You'll remember that Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, before Moses died, and they had not yet entered into the land led by Joshua, the land of Canaan on the west side of Jordan, if they could have the area that they were in, in the east side of Jordan, Moses thought it might be some sort of ruse to not go over and help the other Israelites take the land of Canaan, and they promised that they would go and fight with those who were over Jordan, and that uh, they would stay with it until the battle was over and the war won. Then they would return. There's another great sermon where Moses said, all oh, that's well and good, but if you violate it, be sure your sins will find you out. As I say, that's another sermon, but Joshua tells us here they stood good to the promise they made to Moses. Now I said we're going to look at fellowship, division, fact-finding, and fairness. 
and we want to note something about the text that I just read as we head toward that very part of the discussion of this sermon. Now, concerning Joshua 22, 1 through 6, Numbers chapter 32 tells us how the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh wanted to settle on the eastern side of Jordan, as I said. And we have the record there of what went on between them in the conversation they had with Moses. Joshua chapter 4 tells us that these tribes uh, went armed then to do what they promised to do. And then we see from verses 1 through 6 of Joshua 22 that they stood true to their word, as I've said two or three times already. Now, Joshua 22 is the account of their return, but especially some events surrounding that return as they settled into those lands east of the Jordan. So what do we learn from Joshua 22? Let's see if we can help ourselves on that. First of all, I said we would look at fellowship. Of course, in the New Testament, the word for fellowship mostly used by the Holy Spirit and the inspired writers is koinonia, which means a sharing, partnership, working together to a common good. And if you look at verses 1 all the way through verses, uh, well, we'll say we'll end in verse 9, you will see that this comes out in Joshua 22, I'll begin reading in verse 7 where we left off after 6. Now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan, but unto the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side, Jordan, westward. And when Joshua sent them away also into their tents, then he blessed them. And he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents and with very much cattle, with silver, and with gold, and with brass, and with iron, and with very much raiment. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. And so we then see in verse 9, And the children of Reuben, and the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go unto the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession whereof they were possessed, according to the word of the Lord, by the hand of Moses. So they have been blessed. They've been blessed with much that is of material worth. Cattle and silver, gold, brass, iron, those things precious at that time, and very much raiment. And when we today in spiritual Israel are obedient to the authority of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as found in the words of the New Testament, because we study it, write and divide it, learn it with the intent to render obedience to God, we too find all spiritual blessings in heavenly places have been located in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Consider what Moses had to say in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 8. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. We'll make a spiritual application to that for those who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Those who have heard the gospel, God's power to save men from sin, Romans 1.16, who've believed it from the heart, have obeyed it, Romans 6.17 and 18, Acts 2, verse 30. We know the Lord has added them to that spiritual body, which is the church, the place of all the redeemed, those redeemed by the blood of Christ. We have God's blessing for being faithful to him. Listen to Luke 11. And verse 28, but he said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Now the disciples here were rejoicing over the matter of demons. They'd been given the power to cast out demons. They were rejoicing over those miracles they could work. But here's where the great emphasis ought to be to you and to me, even as it was to fleshly Israel. That is that we should feel greatly blessed and we should know others are blessed 
when they honestly receive the word of God, Luke 8, 15, and they keep it. They hear it, they understand it, and they keep it. That's why John said to Christians in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, speaking of apostles of Christ, declare we unto you that ye may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We also have the blessing of fellowship and unity as taught in the scriptures with brethren who are of the same mind, the same judgment, and the same faithful obedience. And we're ordered by God in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. In fact, we read in 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know that the Lord, in John chapter 17, 20 through 23, prayed to the Father that all those who would believe on him through the apostles' word would be one. He had prayed that for the apostles. He then said the same for you and me and all others who would receive with meekness and grafted word, believe it, obey it, and remain steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's just another way of saying that you're faithful to the Lord as a child of God. Unity, as the Bible teaches it, oneness among the children of God, members of the church, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the body of Christ, brothers and sisters in the family of God, is something for which we must endeavor. We put all of our life into it. That's what Paul's writing about when he wrote to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 3. We're even uh, admonished and made to see better from the Old Testament in the book of Psalms how wonderful unity among God's people is. But remember, that unity does not take place between men except that each person has believed and obeyed the gospel and dwells faithfully in Christ according to the teachings of the New Testament. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 133 and verse 1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And that should be the case with every one of us, but it takes an attitude of saying, Not my will to God, we say this, and mean it, not my will, but thine be done. We seek the authority of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is our sovereign king, because the church of our Lord is not a democracy of any kind. It's not a republic, but Christ is the absolute monarch who rules through his perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, and he expects us, if we love him, to keep his commandments. In fact, if one truly loves Jesus Christ, he will keep his commandments, John 14, verse 15. Now, that's the fellowship that we seek. We should not seek this oneness under any other conditions than that all are obedient to God. That was the case that we started with in the Old Testament regarding the children of Israel, as we read. But then I said we would talk about division. Brethren not being able to get along with one another. Well, I want you to notice chapter 22 of Joshua, and look at verses 10, verses 10 through 20. Joshua 22, same chapter we started with, verses 10 through 20. And when they came into the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan and the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, 
a whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves to gather at Shiloh to go up to war against them. And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest. And with him ten princes of each chief house, a prince throughout all the tribes of Israel, and each one was an head of the house of their fathers among the thousands of Israel. And they came unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead, and they spake with them, saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord, in that ye have builded you an altar, that ye might rebel this day against the Lord? Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that ye must turn away this day from following the Lord? And it will be, seeing ye rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over into the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth, and take possession among us. But rebel not against the Lord, nor rebel against us. In building you an altar beside the altar of the Lord our God, did not Achan the son of Zerah commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel? And that man perished, not alone, in his iniquity." Let's look at this for a moment, bring out the points that we're interested in. When these tribes returned, then we see that they built an altar, not just an altar, but a great altar, and it was near the Jordan River. Now, word, you know, gets around. People are going to say things. They either tell the truth or they don't. Well, word got back to those on the western side of the Jordan River that this altar had been built, and who built it? And this upset them greatly. Now, let me drive a peg down here and emphasize this as it applies to the Lord's church, spiritual Israel today. These people had learned some lessons, some important lessons that they would forget in time, but not now. They realize that you can depart from God. They had seen it happen among their own brethren, and they saw how that those who sinned were punished, but yet the whole of Israel was punished when one in Israel sinned. And they were very concerned about keeping Israel pure. Well, these things are written aforetime for our learning. Paul said, Romans 15, 4, much is said in the New Testament about the church being pure. And so we can learn from here just how strongly a faithful member of the church of spiritual Israel should follow fleshly Israel and these things that are written aforetime for our learning, Romans 15, 4. So we are able to see that they were greatly concerned that these people had built an altar whereby they would begin to sacrifice to whoever when the law of Moses did not permit such things. And all I can say to you now is go back and read Deuteronomy, the restatement of the law by Moses to Israel before they passed over Jordan. Now, Phineas was selected with 10 princes of the different tribes to go and ascertain the situation because division was building. And you see that Phineas reminds them of the sin in Peor where some went to worship Baal and 24,000 were killed by God the record of which is found in Numbers chapter 25. Let me pause here because I want to drive a peg down here and give great emphasis to faithful Phineas. Now, he brings up the heresy of Peor, and that account appears immediately after the account of Balaam. We won't go back into all of that right now, but 
He had been hired by the Moabite chieftain Balak to curse the Israelites, and Balaam failed to do so as God had put words in his mouth that turned out to be a blessing for Israel. Instead, the first prayer said by Jews as part of their daily prayer service comes from this exact text. That's just simply a passing note about them still to this day. Well, having failed to curse them, then Balaam left his own country. And the book of Numbers records a direct connection between Balaam and the events at Peor that Phineas brings up to these tribes of the east of Jordan. And he was an eyewitness and an integral part of that matter, especially when it came to it being solved and stopping God's people from being further destroyed by God for their sin. Now, he points out that this started with the Moabites. And actually what happened is that Balaam said, now I can't curse the children of Israel. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But uh, they'll sin and God will punish them because all you have to do is get them to engage in false worship to your gods. And they, that involved all kinds of immorality. And so they did. And that's what's happened. What happened? And you can find that account in Numbers chapter 31, verse 16. Well, orders were given to kill all the idolaters. But a fellow by the name of Zimri, the son of an Israelite prince, Salu, from the tribe of Simeon, openly defied Moses and publicly showed his opinion to those standing at the tabernacle entrance with Moses by going to Cosby, the daughter of a Midianite prince by the name of Sir, and actually engaging in fornication. And here's where Phineas, and I like Phineas. He was faithful. His faithfulness gave him boldness. He loved God with all his heart, and he loved the will of God. And in a moment of great strength, born of nothing less than holy zeal for God and his will. Phineas went after them and ran them through with a spear. And the scripture says he thus stayed the plague that had broken out among the people because of this sin. So God noticed that Phineas showed great faith, fidelity, and loyalty, and great bravery for God in the doing of his will and God decided not to destroy all the children of Israel in anger because of one man's faithful obedience, and that was Phineas, for he and his action made atonement for their sins. Now, it's interesting that God declared that Phineas and his sons for all eternity would receive divine recognition for this, a covenant of peace and the covenant of an everlasting hereditary priesthood. And thus we show again, as these things written aforetime for our learning, the proof of the fulfillment of that prophecy and teaching the very thing this day in this sermon. Now we would do well if we want to understand how we should love God with all that we have and are and love his word, love the pureness of the church, to learn a lesson as it was practiced by Phineas on physical Israel. As we look at the purity of the church and the teaching of the New Testament concerning purity among the people of God in the church today. Now, as I say, why were they so greatly concerned that they'd built an altar? Well, they were assuming some things here, but look what they did. They took this zealous, dedicated, faithful, Phineas, and ten princes of Israel, and they had an expedition to go find out what the facts are in this matter. Because under the patriarchal age, you remember that Noah used an altar, Genesis 8, 20, to worship God. So did Abraham in Genesis 22, 9, and Isaac in chapter 26, verse 25 of Genesis. And we see Jacob doing the same thing in Genesis chapter 35, verse 1. So, they wondered what's going on here. 
because God had designated in the law of Moses, and it's repeated several times by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, that you will only offer sacrifices at the place where I will place my name in Israel. Now, in time, later on, that would be when the tabernacle was placed in Jerusalem, and following that, the temple was in Jerusalem. But we're not going into those historical biblical facts now. So they concluded, these tribes that had passed over Jordan, that these folks were simply trying to separate themselves and go into some kind of heresy and making sacrifice where the law of Moses said you're not to make sacrifice. So they were concerned that there would be division in Israel. I'd like to ask the question, why can't we be that concerned today and be as zealous as Phineas and those Israelites were who passed over Jordan concerning what their brethren were up to? This doesn't just take up space in the Bible to record a historical event. We learn from the scriptures that we are to be concerned about what we believe and how we live, what we teach. And he did not say, well, you know, in the matter with Phineas and the people committing sin, let's just let them continue on with the children of Israel and by the good example that the other faithful children of Israel have, then these folks will learn better and they'll benefit from that kind of fellowship. It seems to me when God approves a man like Phineas doing what he did based on the authority of the law of Moses is concerned for the purity of Israel, there ought to be something to learn about that for us today in the church. These people on the west side of Jordan, these Israelites, were also concerned that the Lord would punish them for what uh, these tribes to the east of Jordan were doing. But it doesn't seem that a lot of people realize that when we allow a uh, little leaven to leaven the whole lump, that God's going to punish all of us. He did then. Tell me what's changed. First and foremost, here is what really was going on. Those tribes that went in to possess the land wanted to do things the Lord's way. That was the key to the whole thing. That was what was in the mind of Phineas when he ran that man and woman through and stopped God's plague. We also need to be concerned for doing things the Lord's way. You read the book of Hebrews, you'll see that he says we have far greater blessings in Christ today than the Israelites ever did. We should be even more concerned then, lest we neglect those things. Consider what Peter had to say in 1 Peter 4.11. And it's familiar to all of us. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. Now listen, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, move that back to the days of Phineas. And you'll see under the law of Moses and fleshly Israel, that's exactly the attitude he had, and God expected every Israelite to have it concerning the law of Moses in service to God in the Mosaical dispensation. But even Jesus took this attitude. John chapter 12, verses 49 and 50 read, For I have not spoken of myself, Jesus speaking, but the Father which sent me he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. And that's what Peter is saying concerning all of us relative to speaking by the authority of the New Testament. Thus, we see appropriate action taken in response by these tribes who have gone over Jordan to the west when they are concerned about just exactly what are these other tribes that went back to the east side of Jordan doing? Are they apostatizing? Are they trying to separate themselves from us? Are they going to violate the law? For not only will it bring trouble to them, but it will bring trouble to us. So Israel gathered for war 
at Shiloh. I think that's interesting. In the Civil War in West Tennessee, there was one of the greatest battles. In fact, it was one of the greatest battles, the greatest battle in the western part of the war, one of the greatest battles in the whole war. And it happened at Shiloh. Well, that's Hebrew for peace. Now, notice what's said. The, the Israelites gather for war at a place called peace. That's interesting. You know, there can only be peace between God and man when man humbly and lovingly learns the will of God and does it always. And there can only be peace between the people of God when all the people of God are faithful to God, even as we're studying right here. And thus the faithful must be concerned about what their brethren do, what they teach, what they practice, how they live. As I say, this account wasn't just written to take up space and give us a curious history of these people. The Holy Spirit tells us in the New Testament, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So as they gathered at Shiloh for war, they were preparing for the worst. Some people don't understand that. You know, if you, and I had this told me long years ago by a teacher of mine, when he was talking about preparing for debate, he said, if you go prepared to meet a bear, but you meet a rabbit, then you're prepared as ever could be in both cases. And that's what some of us don't understand. Even the prophet Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So they were preparing every day. If Israel had kept this attitude, what happened in the days of the judges would not have happened, but they lost it. So they sent Phineas and others as ambassadors to represent their concerns to these tribes east of Jordan. And we too in spiritual Israel must take appropriate action in response, in response to spiritual division. We must be concerned, and let me emphasize this, about the facts in the case and not just what is rumored. And we must be prepared to investigate it to learn what the facts are. It's highly interesting to me that some people are very critical of other brethren because they don't love and they act on assumptions and how do you know that's right? When you then try to research and find out the facts on the matter, they get upset about that too. So you really can't win. You're between a rock and a hard place. And people like that really are just selfish and self-willed. What they're really saying is, leave us alone, let us do what we want to, and don't bother us. But I want you to consider that Jesus taught about this. If there was a problem where one brother sins against another brother in Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 20. The brother sinned against should be going to the one who sinned against them, and it should remain there and not be spread further if it is settled there. Then you can read Matthew 18, 15 through 20 to see what happens if between those two it's not settled. But you'll also see from Acts chapter 15 that brethren met in Jerusalem not to determine the truth about whether the gospel should be preached to uncircumcised Gentiles, but to determine where this business came from that was first dealt with by Paul and Barnabas in Antioch of Syria. Remember, certain came from Jerusalem teaching that you Gentiles can be saved, but you must be circumcised to keep the law. Well, Paul knew better than that. He was an apostle. He received his information by revelation of Jesus Christ, and he immediately contended with them. Well, then why go to Jerusalem? They wanted to know where this business started. They wanted to know where this false doctrine came from. And if you read Acts 15, you'll see it came from some Pharisees who had obeyed the gospel, and they were trying to make Gentile Christians second-class Christians. It was not tolerated. One minute, Paul tells us in Galatians. Immediately they were confronted. But notice, first of all, the facts were ascertained. 
They didn't go off, as we used to say, half-cocked. They had their facts well in hand. They understood what was going on, and they dealt with it. It's a matter of what we would call documenting and finding evidence and what evidence actually is. So we cannot sit idly by when problems arise. You wouldn't in your own family if you were being what a husband and father ought to be toward the family or a righteous wife and mother. You would want to know the facts of the case. And there is not any father and mother who in dealing with the rearing of their children many times don't have to set somebody down, one of the children or all of them, and get to the bottom of a given matter. So we can't afford to just sit around and not investigate matters and just go on hearsay. And notice what these people did. They took the time to select the right people. A man like Phineas. And you can be sure those ten princes that went with him to those tribes on the east of Jordan were of the same character. They were going to weigh the thing on the basis of absolute objective truth and facts. Well, that's the point that we make, and I think you can see it in verses 21 through 29. And here's what they learned. They learned that these brethren had built this altar, that's true, but not an altar of worship. It was a memorial. It was to cause them to remember they were part of Israel, that they served the same God that they kept the same law. And so you'll see that it was nothing to do with violating the law of Moses or false worship, as has been rumored. So they got to the facts. They uh, had different intentions. And they took the time, those on the west side of Jordan, to pick the right kind of men who would go on the facts and send them and take the time investigate the matter. So they desired for their children to remember, that is, those on the east side of Jordan, that they too worshiped with the rest of Israel in the place appointed. Later it would be Jerusalem. They did not want the rest of Israel saying to them that they had no part with the Lord since they were on the east side of Jordan. They agreed that they ought not to rebel against God and worship in an unauthorized way. The two and half tribe, two tribes and the half tribe respected the truth of God's word for them and acted on the basis of proper knowledge. In effect, they knew the principle that the great prophet Jeremiah uttered in chapter 17 of the book that bears his name, chapter 17 and verse 10. Listen to what Jeremiah says. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. They knew not to be like the wicked, the wicked person being one who does not live like the word of God says. The psalmist in Psalm 10 and verse 4 wrote, The wicked and the pride of his countenance saith, he will not require it. All his thoughts are, there is no God. These two tribes and half tribe recognize God's authority and the law of Moses for them over every aspect of their life. They understood and remembered what Moses had said as recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 32. Listen to what he said. Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Do you think under the authority of Christ of the New Testament for the church that that same principle is binding today? Look with me over to what is said in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not unto thine own understanding. 
in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Why, that affirms the Lord's authority regarding how we conduct our lives, and for the faithful in the church to be involved with how their brothers and sisters conduct their lives. Anybody teaches to the contrary, just doesn't know what he's talking about, is in rebellion to God himself. Now, these tribes gave then a scriptural and reasonable explanation for the altar they built. They wanted a memorial for their children to remember that they were a part of Israel too and served the same God by the same law. Now, that reminds me that their answer was consistent with what we find in the New Testament in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Listen to what he says. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Now watch, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. There's no one way to answer every man. You deal with the man according to the situations. Certainly, Phineas didn't deal with the tribes east of Jordan the way he dealt with that fornicating man and woman. But it's the same Phineas, following the same law, with the same right attitude, and the same love of God, and the same love of Israel and the law. Some ways, it seems people today just don't understand that. They can't figure out how Paul could write 1 Corinthians chapter 13 on love, and yet withstand Peter to the face because of the sin Peter committed. Listen, though, to what Peter himself said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, another familiar passage with Bible students, 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready. Were the children of Israel getting ready? They sure were, in case they ran into a worst-case scenario with those tribes east of Jordan. Be ready always, not sometimes, now and then, but always, to give an answer. You know that this translates the... Greek, apologia, which means to make a defense for what you believe in practice, to give an answer to every man, not some men, but every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Now, the facts were ascertained by those brethren, Phineas, and those with him concerning the intentions and the actions of the tribes east of Jordan. And when they saw everybody was acting in close concert with the authority of the law of Moses, everything was okay. And that's the way it should be in spiritual Israel, the church today. Today, if we're going to have peace in the religious world around us or within the body of Christ, there's only one way to do that. We must recognize God's written word, the Bible, as the only authority for religious practices today. And it must be studied and rightly divided and honestly applied to our lives. That's exactly what Paul was saying to the young preacher Timothy in an off-quoted verse, 2 Timothy, or verses 3, 16, and 17, where he wrote, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. We also must... Respect, then, the knowledge given to us in the Bible. We must recognize God's authority, Colossians 3.17, Matthew 28.18. And we must present reasonable truths and be ready to do so by proper study. Now, I mentioned we would look at fairness. Well, if you look at Joshua 22.30-34, I won't read that right now, Joshua 22, 30 through 34, for sake of time. You'll find that when Phineas heard their statement, he was pleased with it. He concluded that they had not transgressed God's will. He concluded that fellowship still existed among them. He concluded that God would not punish them for their actions. And why? Because their actions were in harmony with the law of Moses. So he returned to the rest of Israel and he testified to that fact to all of Israel. They, in turn, received that information from credible witnesses, and they accepted it. Now, what was the result of all of this? 
there was peace in Israel. So we learned that in order to be fair with those with whom we have a problem, we ought to hear all sides of the story. We ought to be open to investigation. Everybody should be. If you've got a problem and somebody's trying to investigate it, learn the facts of it, and some people or person in that problem doesn't want it investigated, it tells you much about that person and their honesty and integrity or lack thereof. Phineas did what the law prescribed, Deuteronomy 13, 12, and 14 through 14. Let me say that again, Deuteronomy 13, 12 through 14. He did the investigating. He found out the facts of the matter. He learned the truth from the same. Consider Proverbs 18, verse 13. He that giveth answer before he heareth, it is folly and shame unto him. Seems like a lot of my brethren love to jump at conclusions when they don't have facts that justify those conclusions. Well, the Lord doesn't look lightly on this. And here was a lesson in the long ago in a book written to teach us how we should act in cases like this that makes it clear that God doesn't want us to act on the basis of not proving our case. Remember Paul's statement, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That's exactly what Phineas was doing, First Thessalonians 5.21. Nicodemus also said to Jesus, or not to Jesus, but uh, to those round about him, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? Well, he's talking about the same law that Phineas had. And so you see the attitude. James writes this to Christians. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. James 1, 19 through 20. Now think about that when it comes to Phineas and God commending Phineas for doing what he did with those Moabites, those people who were not God's people. He commended him said his name should be remembered. He was exemplary. Well, I would say that uh, furious, righteous zeal and indignation that took the lives of two people is something to look at for a moment. Especially when God said he did the right thing. Yet over here, he takes the time to get the facts in hand. He had the facts in hand with the two committing fornication and acted according to the law. He ascertained the facts by going over to the tribes on the eastern side of Jordan and realized they were in harmony with the law. Same man, same zeal, same character, same love of God, same concern for doing the law of Moses, yet look at his reaction in both cases, how different they were. We learned that Phineas discerned then between the secular and and the religious, that is, between setting up a memorial for them and when he set up an altar to worship God. So it was not the two and a half tribes' intention to use the altar in a religious way of worship. It was simply a memorial. Well, I want to close with what we find in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Paul writes of the churches of Galatians, thus and part of the New Testament to us. For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. If those tribes on the west of Jordan had gone on the assumption that that altar built by the tribes on the east of Jordan was an altar for sacrifice, then they would have gone to war needlessly and the whole thing would have failed because they did not take the time to ascertain the facts and act fairly. We must do that. We must not go off half cocked. So in considering lessons from Joshua 22, let's remember fellowship, Division, fact-finding, and being fair one with another. If we'll do that from an honest and pure heart, 
determined to do all things as the New Testament authorized. We'll know when to be Athenius with a spear, and we'll know when to be Athenius to research and find the facts and learn the truth and act accordingly. And that's a lesson so few people ever learn and apply consistently. Now we want to say to those who may be out of Christ, lost in your sins, if you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is Nazareth, the Son of God, you're willing to repent of your sins as you obey the truths of the Bible, Acts 17 30. Confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10 10, and be buried with your Lord in baptism, Romans 6 3 and 4, and Acts 2 38. Your sins will be remitted in the mind of God, and the Lord will add you to the church, Acts 2 47. And therein you can serve him faithfully, acting only according to the authorized will of heaven for Christians. If you're a child of God, you've sinned, you're not living faithful, then you can repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. We hope this lesson has helped us be more mindful of ascertaining the facts that we might be fair, that we'll act according to the authority of God's will, that we'll have the courage to practice the truth under any and all situations and circumstances. Thank you very much. We're glad you've been able to be with us.